Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. It's going to be a super mini mail call and yes, I'm using my new setup where I'm using my Elgato capture device in combination with OBS to have multiple cameras and stuff like that. So there's a little bit more variability, let's just say, for second channel videos as opposed to just using my normal Sony camera for a single camera that I just sort of move around. Uh, this way I can actually switch inputs and stuff. So yes, super mini mail call. There are a lot of items that have been building up over the last several months. So I'm just gonna pick one that's uh, been here for a long time and it's really big. So let's open it up. So this package, which has been here for a while, looks like it actually comes from Seth in Tampa, Florida. Although I think it was a drop ship because the reason why I know it's from Seth is it says on the label on the side here, King Cake. And that's sort of what he puts on the packages to uh, let me know that it came from him. Obviously caution heavy, this thing is quite a big box. It's on a dolly here for, uh, well, let's just say ease of uh, rolling around the floor. And let's see, what do we have in here? We have that foam that uh, goes around monitors and stuff or monitors, it goes around anything. It just goes around things that are heavy to help them not get broken. What is this? There's something uh, metal and heavy looking in here. Um, FM bandwidth and recording time. What the, what the indeed. Oh boy, this is heavy. Okay, uh, let me figure out how to get this out of the box. Well, I managed to get it up on its side and uh, it's something with a whole lot of buttons and coax BNC type jacks on the front. And a power cord. <laughs> Glad that was included. Okay, it's here on the bench and um, <laughs> yeah, it's really big and it's really heavy. What? What is this thing? I just repositioned the camera for a little easier viewing. So uh, if you're wondering, I'm using a, a wireless camera. It's actually an app on my phone that streams to the OBS receiver. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What is this thing? TIAC cassette data recorder? What? What? Oh, I can barely move this thing. It is so heavy. Let's get the camera position a little better. Uh, yeah, so it's a wireless camera. It's an app that streams from one of my phones. There's a little bit of delay, so I wouldn't want to show my face because uh, you'd see my mouth not talking uh, correctly. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be attached very well. Oh, actually, that just that actually comes off. That's supposed to come off. That is normal. But maybe let's uh, take that off for now and open that up. So yeah, data recorder, calibration date. This looks like, uh, uh, I don't know what kind of cassette this uses. <laughs> I was thinking it's like a, a, v a VHS tape or something, but let's move this a little closer. That is definitely not what we have here. Let's see if I can get this in so you can really see. Yeah, that's not, that is not VHS. <laughs> Whatever that is, it's something else. Um, whoa, 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 what a strange thing. All right, so looking at the front, we can see many BNC jacks, including one that's uh, crushed right there. Monitor out, memo in. There seems to be 21 channels or or something, I don't actually know. There's a screen. We have a power button right here, local. I mean, I have no idea. And on the front here, the TIAC XR7000 cassette data recorder. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, tape speed up and down. Okay, yeah. Um... <laughs> And like the weight, it is so heavy. It is so heavy. It's absolutely a boat anchor. <laughs> There's that BNC jack that got squished. This one as well, these two. Um, probably it can be bent back into shape, I'm assuming. Doesn't seem like there's any other damage to the front. So the shipping or the packing was pretty good. 
Oh, and uh, yeah, let me talk about the camera that I'm using again. It's one of my old cell phones, and I'm running this NDI app from New Tech, as in, yes, the video toaster people. And there's a plugin for OBS, among other things, and you can have multiple cameras, and it runs at 1080p. And unfortunately, the biggest problem is the delay. So, so if I tap this, you can hear there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, that's the only negative. Now, of course, it streams audio, so I'm sure the audio coming through it is absolutely fine. But I'm recording the audio directly into OBS through my wireless mic, so that's why they're out of sync a little bit. But I really like this because the camera is uh, just running on battery right now on the tripod, and yet it is streaming into the computer. In fact, if we just switch this over to the camera that's on my bench, there's the phone right now, which is actually streaming over Wi-Fi to OBS, and it is one of my inputs, so I can just switch back and forth to it like that, like that. It's very easy. Now, the light doesn't look so good because I'm up lighting right now to make uh, this camera, this, this camera here, work a little better. Anyhow, let's flip this thing around and let's take a look at the back. Okay, so looking at the back, there it is. That's the uh, TIAC badge label. We have some, I don't know, connections. Uh, 25 amp DC fuse, six amps AC. <laughs> There are these ID connections. We have a printer connection, which has a cap over it. Uh, display, internal, external channel, system reset, remote, trigger input, TTL, and um, I guess an option connector. And it looks like there is a back panel you can flip down. Oh, <laughs> okay. Now there's a card location thing here. Power off for plug in out of cards and the Japanese writing. GPIB, that would be the option board, ID board, FM amp, channel one through 21. I guess I should take one of these cards out. Let's see how that happens. This is the eight card. So yeah, there it is. There's a hybrid, there's some surface mount, there's a bunch of through hole. What does this thing do? <laughs> I have no idea. None at all. Let's slide that back in and I guess, let's power this thing up. Let's get that back in there. There we go, it seems to be clipped in. We'll just close this back lid here. Flip, flip. I have a power cord right here, so let's just plug this in the back, if I can find the input. And let's give this a power on. Aha, wow, what is this? It's like a plasma screen or something. It had a display on there, but it has uh, since faded off. Hmm. All right, well, let's eject this and I'll put that cover back on. Why did it make so many clicks? I don't know. So it looks like this cover can just properly go back on. There it is. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that's, Interesting, it doesn't seem to want to stay in uh, the ejected position. Let's just try it without the lid. Ah, no, it's not doing that either. Hmm. In fact, it seems like this thing is not responding to anything anymore. Even though when it powered on, it actually had something on the screen here. Let's, uh, look at that actually latches. So init data setting. And there it is, it displayed something. Oh, and it didn't go away this time. That doesn't sound normal. All right, so that's the screen there. Now it's pretty dim and you can see there's a refresh. Now that is not there on uh, my eyes. Um, it does say FM source, so that's changing. So there's definitely like some functionality going on here now. Let's see, display. Hmm, I wish there was less glare. Let me try to reposition the camera so it will be a little easier to see. Okay, how about that? If I put my hand near it, unfortunately it does reflect. So I will try not to. System. So there's a system menu with a bunch of stuff. Power software mode, power fail restart, preset initialization, channel 22 memo, miscellaneous. Self-test, if you hit OK, yes. Self-test unit, start, press yes, no. 
Okay, so it's running a self-test now. Hmm, the fact that the screen blanked out, that's not reassuring, not at all. All right, well, let that sit a moment, but I don't understand why this doesn't latch again once I hit the eject button. Although when I power it off, then I'm able to do that. But none of these buttons seem to do anything, and now the screen is off. I don't think I can do anything but power cycle it. Speaker volume. Hmm. Let's power that off and see if this latches. Okay, there we go. Now it's latching. Init data settings. Aha, I hit this monitor mode button and the screen blanked out. And now it doesn't appear to show anything on the screen. Okay, maybe now. There it is. Let's see if the tape transport stuff works. Probably not going to do anything without a tape in there. And it doesn't. I see this here adjust the tape speed. There's a little display right there. Oh, come on. Why does it keep blanking out like this? Hmm. Well, at this point, this thing doesn't seem to stay running for more than a few seconds, or at least the screen doesn't appear to stay on for more than a few seconds. I still have absolutely zero idea what this thing is. So why don't we go look up what the TIAC XR7000 actually is? I put TIAC XR7000 into Google here. What are we seeing here? Okay, that is not a useful site, not at all. Let's check out this BMI surplus. Whoa, okay, a lot of test leads. And absolutely no information about what that is. All right, here we are on TIAC's site. So this is a wideband data recorder. Well, obviously that's something modern, similar but modern. I'm just going through all the links here to try to find any that seem to be related. And here's someone trying to control it with LabVIEW. Uh, okay, that doesn't really help me. Here's something from the Museum of Magnetic Sound Recording. And there it is. The TIAC XR7000 is a 21 channel instrumentation recorder. Frequency 40 kilohertz dual display modes. Bar graph for all data channels or two channel waveform display. FM wideband group one recording plus high band recording, which doubles wideband group one response to DC 40 kilohertz ID information recording. This doesn't tell me anything. Uh, well, it, okay, it looks like it uses videotapes. So that's something I can stick a tape in here and we can try it. I don't, I was expecting to see the normal uh, transport with like a helical scan in there, but maybe this uses a VHS tape, but a linear transport or it's a linear recording or, or something. I, I don't know. That's very interesting. Uh, there seems to be like a whole bunch of different recorders on here besides the this particular TIAC one. Hmm. I did a new search with manual to try to figure out what this might be and that didn't really give us anything. Uh, utility software, well, this is the WX7000, which is a new model, not this old one. And I am really not finding anything. I have XR7000 in quotes, manual, all that stuff. I've tried to different, some different permutations and it has turned up pretty much nothing. It's kind of hard to fix things. You don't even know what they do or how they should work. So the manual would be helpful just to at least explain the normal operation of this thing. And I just don't know yeah, anything about this, especially because it doesn't stay running. Clearly, that's not right. The screen shouldn't just turn off after a few seconds. I don't think it should, at least. So I'm going to have to ask you, the viewers, to uh, see if you can dig up any information on this thing. Service manuals would be great. Operations manual would be great. Even if you've had experience with this thing and you can just tell me what it does, what it was used for, that would be very helpful. Clearly, this one's not quite working correctly. Like the eject seems to get stuck there and the screen also turns off <laughs> very quickly. Which clearly, are, both of those things are false. But I can only imagine if we take the top cover off this and does have four screws here that it's probably really, really complicated and a service manual will be absolutely essential to really do anything on this. So yeah, please comment down below if you can uh, give me any advice or any help with this thing.
I will try a videotape in here. I just have this one here, which is Adrian's Digital Basement CRT videos. It actually has video on here. Let's turn this on. Screen came on. Uh, well, screen turned off. So the fact that I'm still able to eject while the screen's not working kind of implies that whatever's wrong with the screen is unrelated. Um, let's see if that, hey, okay, cool. So with the tape in there, it actually latches even while it's powered on. So let's hit rewind. Nah, okay, tape transport, don't do anything. What about eject? Well, that doesn't work either. Let's power this off and on again. I hope my tape comes out of here. I saw the thing move. Uh-oh, that didn't sound good at all. Hmm, it was making weird noises, clunky noises, things like that. Okay, it's doing something. Let's see if it's chewing up the tape. Please eject. Whoa. Uh-oh. <laughs> that was kind of funny. I don't think it's happy though. Maybe this doesn't take normal VHS tapes. Looks like it's doing something inside of there. Give me my tape, please. Oh dear, oh dear. It's not like this tape is uh, magical or anything. Like, I mean, I could make another one. This is just an old like movie that I've recorded over something. But seems to have eaten the tape. Let's make sure this is latched in all the way. Turn it on. So it's like it's trying to feed the tape around some kind of head there. Okay. So rewind. Yeah, I mean, you can't see it on the camera, but I can see uh, some like cap stands turning and stuff. Fast forward, or this is just forward, not fast forward. I think it's chewing up the tape though. <laughs> and there's a fast forward and a rewind here. No, I don't like the noises it's making. It sounds very unhappy. Oh, there we go, I got the tape out. How bad is it? How bad is it? Well, it doesn't look like it chewed it up too badly, but um, I should have used a tape that I didn't have anything recorded on. It would have been like more of a sacrificial tape. Definitely seems to be jamming up though. Let me grab uh, another junk tape and stick it in here. All right, here's another tape. This is a bit more of a junk tape I really don't care about. So it's in there properly. All right, and you can see it like spooling up the tape there. And we hit forward. Okay, it looks like it's moving properly. I don't hear any weird noises happening. Stop, rewind. Oh, sort of slipping or something. It's like it's binding up somewhere in a transport. Fast forward's going pretty quick and that seems to be working okay. And let's do fast rewind. That also seems to be working fine as well. Yeah, but when you do the playback, it sounds like it's chewing up the tape down here over the heads. Yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. Let's rewind this fast. Doesn't sound like it's chewing anything up while it's uh, doing that. And then I uh, can't record because I have the tab broken out. So let's see about the eject. Okay, now that's working. That's cool. Hmm.
looks like while it's playing back, I can adjust the tape speed and it does indeed change. Various speeds are available here. Ah, oh, that's really fast. I'm assuming that the faster it goes, the higher the bandwidth or something like that. Does it go any faster than that? That's the highest speed. But if we turn it way down, it's barely moving. But we got no display, which we knew about. So yeah, very cool. I mean, it's nice that it's doing something. It doesn't seem to be working quite right. But again, maybe the people who are familiar with this device can tell me um, that it uses, say, different tapes, not just normal videotapes. I don't, that's what I don't really know. Uh, that's where the user manual would certainly come in handy. Let's put this door back on. So if we close it, that closes correctly. And when we eject, it doesn't do that click, click, click thing anymore. So that problem has sort of fixed itself. Maybe since we got the tape uh, to actually work in there, so let's load that up. Hit play. Yeah, that seems to be working better now. It doesn't sound like it's chewing out the tape. Hmm. Well, let's rewind. No, that's not rewind. Let's do fast rewind. Hmm. Let's see if eject works. Stop. Eject. Nice. All right, so like I said, it would be great if anyone could explain maybe how this thing works or anything about it. That would be really, really helpful. I've established at least it can record to tapes, but what can it record? Who knows? So thanks very much, Seth, for sending in this mystery device and um, maybe we'll be able to unlock some mysteries as people let me know what this thing can do. Alrighty, next up we have a package here from Avery in Philadelphia. And wow, my face is really dark because this camera has some kind of auto exposure. How about there? That's a little bit better. Uh, the package had a little bit of a blowout as in it opened on its own in transport. But I think it pretty much stayed together. I'm pretty sure because the packing material is all in here. So let me find my cutting instrument. Here it is sitting on the bench open dangerously. Little tiny bit of tape was holding one of the flaps on the bottom. <laughs> so let's see, what do we have in here? We have packing material, something wrapped up in plastic wrap here, bubble wrap that is. Piece of tape stuck to my fingers. There is no note or anything inside there. It feels like this might be a little portable television set. It's kind of what I'm getting the feeling of what this is. And it is, no. Wait, what? <laughs> it's a mega watchman. Okay, now this is really funny because I recently got one of these from someone. Um, I think this has had some serious battery leakage. So what this is is a little television from Sony. I think if we open the bottom up, oh yeah. Oh dear, oh dear. Take a look at that. Uh, these batteries. Seen better days. I should probably get some gloves to do this. Let's use some of this bubble wrap here. I'll take these out. Oh, this sucks. This thing has uh, gotten really crusty because of these batteries. So what this is, is a Mega Watchman as I get these out of here. A Mega Watchman is a little Sony CRT TV. Now the funny thing is, is a friend of mine here in town in Portland uh, randomly finds things that he thinks I might think are interesting. And you know, you can't see my face right now. Let me switch inputs. <laughs> there we go. There's the uh, split screen. So, um, oh boy. <laughs> no, that's not good. Uh, take a look at that. Look at that corrosion there. Not great. It's extremely crusty. Let's just shake this out over the bubble wrap here. Whoa, a lot of junk is coming out of here. It's almost like mud. Anyhow, my friend randomly finds things he thinks I will find interesting. And the funny thing is, is he recently gave me one of these. Now it's not exactly the same. This one looks a little different. Let me go grab the one that he gave me. I didn't actually focus up, show it on the channel because it just worked. But uh, let me go grab it. 
And here's the one that my friend recently gave me. Uh, this one is, uh, well, uh, was there a model number back here? It doesn't appear to be. I think it might have been on the bottom and the battery door on this one is missing. Doesn't matter though, it's not like I use the batteries. This has external antenna input, but it does not have composite video and I had intended to add composite. But this one's kind of neat because it has a little handle on it. This is the one my friend gave me and you can carry it around. I did modify this, uh, well, oh yeah, I modified it because these things use, they have a DC barrel input and also a mains transformer input, well, you know, AC line. And I modified this to use center negative, no, it was center negative by default as is typical of Sony because they do a little switching action when you plug the, the barrel jack in. So I, I took out the AC power supply in here and I swapped this around to be center positive. So I could just use any of my normal 12 volt power supplies. I kind of rewired it inside of here. But yeah, this is a mega watchman and it's also an AM FM radio and it works quite well. It's a big speaker on the top. And this is, has a pull out antenna as well, tuner for the TV and stuff. And this is the one here that Avery just sent in and it's very similar. It, uh, oh, it doesn't have a pull out handle on the top but it has a fold out handle like so. So you can carry it around, uh, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Still a lot of like brown stuff coming out of the bottom. Unfortunately, on this one, the FM antenna or the FM and TV antenna is broken off. Like you would normally be able to pull this out. It is gone. Uh, speaker still on the top though, has the same power button in exactly the same spot as the other one. Oh, the model number is right here on the front, the FD500 on this one. And the other one is the FD510. So this slightly improved version, I guess you could call it. Sony uh, likes to do slight changes, but looking in the video in this picture there, they look basically the same except for the styling. It's just slightly different. So let me move these, uh, so let me just move these crusty batteries out of here. Here, it's like a diaper filled with batteries, yuck. All right, so just like the other set, it has external antenna input. There are controls for the CRT. There's a little like pop out here for the actual CRT. It's actually not made by Sony, the CRT that's in here because they were typically making those flat CRTs for use in their little portable watchmen. This thing has just a normal typical CRT, but I think it's like a three and a half inch or so. Just like the other one I showed, this has the uh, DC input, which will be center negative, and then it will have the uh, mains AC input. And that's what I disconnected on the other one. We do see a manufacturer date right there, April 1990. And on the rest of the back, you know, not a whole lot going on. If we look at the side here, it's uh, pretty dirty. I think a lot of this came from the battery leakage. So you have a TV band selector picture on and off so you can hear the sound from the TV. I've actually turned off the CRT. Good for preserving your battery life if you're running this on battery and you want to hear like your sports game or whatever without the picture, if you're just listening. That's a cool feature. And then we have a function selector, FM, AM, and TV. Tuning knob, volume, tone control. Uh, see if the tuning actually works. It does not. So looks like that's maybe the dial cord in there that's kind of broken. So that's unfortunate because um, we're getting dial cords to work can be kind of difficult and I don't even know what you use for a dial cord. I've never had to fix a dial cord. So if someone has any recommendations of what kind of string or whatever to use that's proper for a dial cord, uh, let me know. Also on the front of this, we have a Halvaline sticker. So <laughs> that's the type of oil. Someone was a big fan of oil, of Texaco. And on the bottom here, it's a Sony. That sticker is still there. Who remembers that from the old days? Come on camera, focus in. There it is, it's a Sony. I remember people when growing up, they had that sticker. Oh, sorry, camera, there you go, focus. They had that sticker on the front of their television right on the CRT and they didn't want to peel it off. They left it there. Like you'd be watching TV at their house and you know, this is on a large TV, like a 27 inch TV and I have it's a Sony sticker right on the picture. And I was like, why, why have that? But I suppose it's like people who don't like to peel off the, the plastic on their like screens and multimeters and whatever. I always peel that stuff right off right away. You know, like the screen protector that comes on your phone, that's gone. But I guess that's, that's why people left it. I, I don't know. This was in the 80s. I don't really get that. And obviously someone 
left it on here, although it's not obtrusive. If this were stuck on the screen, <laughs> I would have peeled that off. On this side, there is only a headphone jack right there, and um, it's a bit dirty, but otherwise, that is it. So um, we can try powering this thing up, but it's pretty much, we know it's not gonna work because uh, the dowel cord's broken, so I can't tune it. Um, well, let's at least power it up and see if it shows a sign of life. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna use the bench supply and we're gonna plug this in here. And of course, uh, as you can see, I have the polarity reversed. That looks like it's already at 12 volts on there. Let's just uh, prop this up. I'll hold it up so it's not resting on the power cord. Uh, function, I guess so we'll leave it on TV. The power button is on the top, so it's off right now. It's okay, it's not drawing any current. All right, sounds like it's working. I hear high voltage, the equivalent of high voltage. Picture on or off? Okay, it's on there. You can see a little dot there up here when you shut off the picture. Definitely not seeing any picture though. So the sound is working. There's a lot of hum in there, which is unusual because it's coming through my linear power supply. So there's not like any hum on the, the DC input and it's drawing 670 milliamps at 12.1 uh, volts. Of course, tuning doesn't work at all and there's no picture. So let's, um, there are some controls on the side here. Let's take a look at them. Contrast, brightness, and vertical hold. So let's see here, contrast, nope. Brightness, that does work. Cool, looks a bit dim. And there's a vertical hold and that does appear to work as well. So we got a picture, that's good. It's free running right now because there's no video input into this thing. And since I have no way to tune it, uh, we can't uh, look at a picture. I could turn on my RF modulator, but that's not gonna work because I have no idea where it's set. I suppose it's set for channel 11, but the thing is I can't just tune to any arbitrary frequency. On my modulator, I can tune exactly to 11. If this thing's not set exactly to 11, we're not gonna get an image. But what I do see on the screen looks good. Deflection is full. I don't see any issues there. Seems to be working. So there are a few things we could try to do with this set. Of course, it is um, DC input, so we don't have to worry about a hot chassis or whatever. We could do a composite mod on this thing and just simply use it as a little mini composite monitor, which certainly could be useful because I mean, look at the form factor of this thing. It's pretty small. And not to mention the sound is working on here, so I could add an RCA jack for the sound and it would be a composite monitor with an actual amplified speaker, which could be pretty, pretty useful. Obviously it's monochrome, but for an Apple II or something, it's probably gonna be fine. Now, because this is a black and white TV, I did a video on a composite mod on a black and white TV, I don't know, a while back it was a Panasonic. And while the image was very sharp, there was the problem of the contrast ratio changing depending on what image you have on the set. Very typical for the way that these TVs are designed. They are not designed for computer display uh, duty. So if you are, say, displaying a little bit of text on the top of the screen, then the black background is gonna be kind of gray. It's gonna get brighter than it should. And as soon as you display a bunch of white stuff on the screen, that'll go away. So you can't really adjust it where you don't have that constantly variable brightness. And that's just the way the cathode drive is designed on those. There's no other, there's no way around that. There's no easy fix, not without completely redesigning the cathode drive circuit inside the set. So while it would produce an image that's usable, it would be no better than using a little black and white TV, which if you've ever done that with your 8-bit computer, it comes with a lot of compromises. It would just be a lot sharper because of course we wouldn't be going through RF anymore. The other possibility is just clean this thing up and then try to fix the dial cord and get the tuner working again, which obviously it broke inside there. And then it would be just like my other one. It would have a, like a working tuner on it. Probably the composite mod would be the way to go with this. And the fact that the bottom is in such rough shape I don't think that matters. I just turned the power off. It's not like I'm ever gonna be using this thing on battery. So really all I need to do is take the case apart here and just give it a good scrub and get all this gunk off of there and just take these um, terminals off entirely and make it where I will never use the batteries. I mean, this thing takes eight batteries. No, 
Yeah, eight. Uh, those D cells, eight Ds. I'm never gonna put eight Ds into something. No, that's that's not gonna happen. So, <laughs> so yeah, there we go. A little Sony Watchman, the FD500. Now, the funny thing is, by the way, is that this has been in the basement for a good number of months now, in the box and unopened. And the one my friend gave me, I think he gave it to me a couple months ago. So after this was sent to me. So it's just kind of funny that that happened. I ended up with two. And it's just like the TV that Seth sent in, I think on the last mail call, it was that, that Panasonic rugged looking, military looking TV. And I had two of them because the same friend who gave me the Watchman gave me that Panasonic one. So I have two of those and now I have two of these. It's just completely funny. <laughs> So thank you very much, Avery, for saying this in. And actually, I'm not even sure it was from Avery. I think that might have been like the, sh the name of the shipper from the store that packed it, or if it was drop shipped from uh, eBay or something, uh, that might be that person as well. So I don't know if this actually came from a viewer named Avery. If it's not actually Avery, well, thank you very much to the viewer who did send this in. You might have sent me an email about it, and I probably forgot just because uh, I get a lot of emails, unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you very much for sending in this mega Watchman. Yes, mega. And I gotta say, having played around with the other one, the speaker on the top actually sounds really quite good. When you listen to FM radio, really nice full sound. And I took the other one apart. The, the driver in there is, you know, decently sized, has a big magnet, and obviously, like you fiddle with the tone controls on the side here, and it sounds shockingly good. So I'm sure TV broadcasts also were very watchable on this compared to, uh, well, those little Casio little portable things they had, which had little tiny speakers that sounded like junk. This thing actually sounded really good, but you know, you paid for it with pretty big heft as well. All right, we have the next package here. This one comes from Bo in Wimberley, Texas. Hi to all my viewers in Texas. This package, like the other ones we've opened, have all been here since last year, 2022. Sorry about the delay. I am very backed up on the mail call right now. Although now that I kind of have, well, once I've sort of broken the seal, so to speak, it's a little easier for me to make the videos. And I'm gonna try to uh, do a whole bunch. I'm not gonna do them tonight because it's getting late. So this will be the last package. But what's this? There's a little something taped in here. What is this? There's a little note, parts repair, spark station, IPC sun, Microsystems, Unix, Linux, Vintage Computer. I'm not sure that that actually goes with this package. That might've just been uh, stuck in there. It's relatively heavy, but I can hear something kind of clunking around in here. Let's see what we got. Okay, let's, let's get this off of here. Whoa, I think this is a spark station. Take a look at that. That is so cute. Wow. Uh, yeah, Spark Station IPC. The floppy drive on there. Loose parts inside. If we look at the bottom, let's zoom up on the label here. There it is, electrical ratings. Okay, so multi-voltage, model number 47. Okay, this is all sort of worn out here. There are some chonky feet on here. And looking straight down, we have a SCSI input here, obviously a cooling fan. This is ethernet, so AUI. I actually have some adapters for that. Uh, we have two connectors here, I think serial. And then we have, okay, it looks like we have a keyboard connector and speaker, keyboard and mouse probably. And that also has a same pinout as these cables. And I don't have any Sun keyboards. So I don't think there's necessarily gonna be any way for me to try this. Now this is, uh, I can connect that up. That is uh, what, 13W3, I have a little adapter for it. Where's that adapter? I have a cable for the silicon graphics machine that I have, so that, that can definitely use that. And then um, some kind of option card here with a nine pin. Power switch, power uh, in and out. And there's the AC out specs. Cool. Well, I think I don't wanna just turn this on without opening it because it is clunking around in there. What is this? Something was there that obviously broke off at some point. Uh, the case has a big crack in it right here, fortunately. I don't think that happened during shipping. It was pretty well wrapped in there uh, with a lot of bubble wrap. So I need to figure out how to get this off. Oh, um, oh, I see. Okay, this looks like a button to push to open the, the cover. Let's see how that works. Okay. 
I pushed them on both sides, even though the broken side, and that released the cover. So, um, how do I do this? I think this goes like this, maybe. Okay, so what was floating around was obviously this uh, plate here. It must have been for a hard drive that is no longer installed. Let's unwrap the wire here. Let's get this plate out of there, okay. Interesting is the floppy drive here, which is a Sony. Figure out how to unplug this. It looks just like the Macintosh ones, although it has a different connector. Sony MPF17WF1. So I wonder if this has, well, this might just be a normal floppy, PC floppy drive, to be honest, because it uh, looks like it's a normal 34 pin connector there. Looks like the case is a bit broken on the front here as well. Hmm. All right, zooming out a little bit. Let's move it over here. Uh, SCSI connector, I guess, for the hard drive that has been removed. RAM slots, more RAM, built-in speaker. This is the card that has the nine pin and that has some RAM on here. What is that card exactly? I know very little about Suns, I have to say. Looks like this is plugged in right here, so you can pop that out. I'll just leave that in because I don't know what it does. Lots more LSI Logic chips all around here. There's a couple, uh, I think these are little poly fuses or something. There's one there as well. Crystal, it's a bit dusty inside, but it's not too bad. I may as well screw this floppy drive back into position. It does have a power cable that is connected as well. That's good. Looks like there's a little bit of rust right here. I wonder what that came from. I wonder if there's a battery in there. We'll just tuck that cable in there. Look at that, made in the USA. Hmm. Flip this over. It's pretty heavy. I guess I didn't need to put this all back together. I could have powered it up on its own. But yeah, if we look at the front here, notice there is no eject button for the floppy drive. There's a disc actually in there right now though. Regular power switch on the back. So I'm just gonna plug the power in. It's off right now. And let's see what happens. Not, oh. Well, it made a click. But, the fan's not spinning. Let's uh, let's take this apart again and try that again with the, this out. All right, and I just noticed, looking at it from this angle, check this rust out right there. That's not good. So this clicks, but the fan is not spinning. So let's take a look at the power coming out of it. Well, that's not outputting anything at all. I assume that was the five volt rail and that is the 12 volts and we got nothing. Let's turn it off and on. Nothing. Looks like she's dead, Jim. That does not work whatsoever at this point. Unhappy power supply. Looks like it's not too hard to get out of here. It'd probably take these screws out there and there's some around the perimeter. And this probably comes out, but I'm assuming we got some leakage, capacitor leakage or battery leakage. Again, I don't really, I don't know what could cause that. Oh, oh yeah, that's, there's caps right there. There's an electrolytic cap under the metal and I bet you that, that let go. That's probably gonna keep this thing from working. Looks like a large cap there. Ooh, it looks very crusty, very, very crusty. Okay, I think that's it. That's the cover released. There's a grommet with these wires here. Oh boy, yeah. Right away, sort of struggling to get this out of the way, I can see some major cap goop. Let's zoom in on that so you can all see that. <laughs> Look at this. That is not good at all. You know there's gonna be a lot. It's, it's, look at this, it's right here. Oh boy, it's all over this. So yeah, this thing's from the 90s. I'm telling you, caps turned to garbage in the 90s. <laughs> 80s, they were good. Well, at least the, you know, the name brand ones. Then the 90s came along, everything turned to crap. And I've seen so many power supplies like this that are just rubbish, as they say. So honestly, no wonder why this thing is not running anymore with a power supply that looks like this. Here we go, it's coming out. 
You can look at how horrible it is on the underside. Oh boy. Yeah, that is a freaking disaster. Let's zoom in on that. Take a look at that mess. Look at this. Look at this goop everywhere. And look at this corrosion. Look, look at this horrible corrosion. This, this unfortunately is what happens when, um, ah, when caps leak and they're left for a long time, this could happen. I mean, I know I don't replace caps. People are like, you gotta change caps. You gotta recap everything. I mean, yeah, it is a, there's a possibility that they will leak. And over time, you know, years and years, I don't know how many years, this happens. Now it's not like this is not fixable. I just have to scrub the heck out of this thing and then use like a Dremel or something to uh, try to remove all that solder mask, then take all the caps off, replace them all, and clean the board really, really well. I think over here it's okay. This is the uh, low voltage side. This is the high voltage side over here, I think, or is it the other way around? I think this is the high voltage side over here, and this is the low voltage side. Sorry, it's not in the best focus. This camera obviously doesn't do the best job of focus. Uh, low voltage side here, so this is like the filter caps and stuff, and yeah, this is just an absolute disaster. Now, if any of the components, you can damage components as well, and there might be some like weird things on here. Uh, I don't see anything. There's like two optocouples, couplers right here, optocouples, optocouplers. They're probably fine. Sony made this power supply, huh? But yeah, these look like over here, it's probably like these are diodes and stuff and they look bad. And all these caps have like hot snot on them. So they're all sort of glued together, which makes them that much harder to get out. So this will have to be an attempted repair at some point in the future. Now, of course, the problem is, is even if I get this power supply working, I have no way to use this computer because I don't have one of those Sun keyboards. If it worked with PS2, like, Still SGI machines, easy peasy, but I have no way to actually interact with this thing with a mouse and keyboard. And of course, Suns use Solaris, the operating system Solaris. It's got a graphical user interface. So you kind of need those things. There's probably a way to like actually um, boot this to a serial console or something like that, I would imagine. Um, but it would be fun to play around with Solaris a little bit, which means mouse and keyboard. But on the other hand, perhaps getting a mouse and keyboard isn't something I should do until I try to fix this power supply. I actually know a couple people in town here who have Sun machines, so they must, I could probably borrow a mouse and keyboard from them if it came down to testing. So yeah, I think I'm just looking for advice on this machine. What is the Sun Spark Station IPC? Is this a powerful machine? I'm sure it's not because it's small. Is it a cool machine? Is it worth fixing? And once it's fixed, what can I do with this thing? Other questions I have, of course, are there common problems on the motherboards on these that go bad? Like, is it just this power supply that has failed on this and the rest of this is completely fine? Like, what are other foibles that can happen with this? Is the floppy drive gonna fail? I think I have actually a CD-ROM drive around. I think I might have a Sun CD-ROM drive around, external one. Kind of looks like this, actually, like as if it would sit on top of this and be the exact same size as this. Anyhow, trying to repair this uh, power supply is beyond the scope of this video. Although I don't really like leaving this as horrible and corroded as this. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I don't have those skinny cylindrical caps in stock that I would need to replace uh, to fix this thing because those caps are very close together. So you have to order those skinny tall ones to fix this power supply. Anyhow, looking for advice on Sun Machines, I know pretty much nothing about them other than I played with them very briefly in the early or late 90s. And yeah, that, that was that, so. Anyhow, okay, I think that's gonna be it. Uh, Bo, thank you very much for sending in this Sun workstation, this IPC Spark Station. And uh, thanks to the other viewers who sent stuff in earlier on in this video. And that is gonna be it for this mail call video. If you like this uh, video, a thumbs up. I hope this format worked with the cameras and my phone over there and all that kind of stuff. I know it's a little unusual and I'm still getting used to it. So I apologize for like little technical foibles and things that I'm, I'm doing. I'm just, I'm basically using OBS to kind of do a lot of the editing on the fly. So when I load this into my computer upstairs, there's minimal amount of editing to do. So anyways, uh, thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs, you know, subscribe, comment, all this stuff. Thanks to my patrons, their names are scrolling beside the screen. And that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.
Well, I think I need to try to figure out what this thing even is. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Oh, darn it. Ah. 